All right. Hello, everyone. Um, pleased to be here today, and thanks to Vatar for great arrangements. Uh, I'm going to speak to you about the Bull Diagnostics, uh, a listed company, um, uh, and I'll go through a little bit about the company as such, uh, a little bit about the second quarter results, because we have not re released our third quarter, and I will also talk about some um, current topics that have emerged recently. So please uh, go ahead and ask questions as we go through the presentation. I also have Christina Rubenhag here with me. She's the CFO of the company, so if we get into the details of the financials, uh, we'll be able to answer that as well. So, uh, Bull Diagnostics. We're a growth company uh, f uh, focusing on the diagnostics market. Uh, headquarters in Stockholm and, and founded in the current form in 1996. However, the technology and, and, the, and the development goes back further in time. Um, and there were many patents made early on in Sweden, uh, and the first patents outside of, of US actually uh, in the area of, of complete blood count. It listed uh, on the Stockholm Stock Exchange since 2011. And what, in short, what we do is we develop, manufacture, and sell these complete blood count systems um, uh, globally. So uh, th these systems are developed by ourselves, uh, and uh, and we we make the instruments, make and uh, and we then uh, are able to earn a recurring revenue from the reagents or the consumables that are used together with with the instruments, uh, and the instruments are of course designed for our pr proprietary uh, consumables. Uh, we are active in both human and veterinary market, uh, even though the veterinary market is relatively small for us, about 10% of revenues globally. Uh, so it's important to note that we commercialize these products and they are really designed for what we call the decentralized uh, diagnostic market. That means near patient diagnostics. Um, that's opposed to the centralized diagnostics, which is at major hospitals and centralized, very large labs, uh, mostly that you can find in, in, in major cities in the Western world. Uh, these systems are designed for physician office labs, primary care units, smaller hospitals where you want to make a diagnosis immediately when you meet the patient um, and, and be able to support a, a diagnosis with that test. Uh, and that way you can avoid sending a test into a major lab and the delays and, and costs that come with that. Um, we also have an acquisition and cooperation strategy. We want to grow our, our business and our portfolio of products. And we are looking at acquisitions and partnerships. Some of them we've already uh, initiated and we'll come to that later in the presentation. So, uh, so we are one of the few global companies actually who have a full in-house capability of developing the, the instruments, which is an you know, assembly of, of a complex system. Um, and then we can make the, the reagents, which is really a chemical manufacturing. And then finally, the controls, which is a, a controlled artificial blood, so a biologic manufacturing. So we can do all those three in-house, even though we are not uh, a very big company compared to many of our global competitors. So what has happened uh, in short during the first half of this year? Well, we have launched uh, two new products in the veterinary market, uh, and that's exciting. A uh, hematology system, uh, which is our core traditionally, but we've also added a chemistry system, which is another type of test that the veterinarians would like to do uh, in oftentimes simultaneously with a hematology test. Uh, so we're happy to be able to offer that, port that package. And uh, that's something that would be relevant in the human market as well. But right now it's only in the vet that we also offer the chemistry. Uh, we have acquired, we've made an acquisition of uh, technology that we're going to use in our next generation uh, product platform. Uh, and I'll get more into the details of that. And we were also happy to be able to win a major tender in India, actually uh, the biggest tender in the company history, 650 instruments in one, in one deal. So that's exciting. So looking at Bull as an investment case, uh, there's a value creation component based on the fairly big installed base of instruments we have that continuously generate reagent sales with good margins. 
uh, we have a good exposure to growth margin growth markets uh, we have been able to successfully develop those historically and we continue to invest in that area we have some competitive advantages that are really critical in our in our field it's the reliability ease of use and low life cycle cost. These are the things that really matter to our customer group because this test is, is a relatively standard type of test. It's a very common one done very, very frequently. Billions of tests are actually taken each year. So what really counts is the reliability, the ease of use, the accuracy and the life cycle cost. We are um, exposed to the global market and our segment that we're active in, the, the near patient uh, the near patient diagnostics is growing in both mature and emerging markets. So, uh, so put it simply, what, what is this test? So again, it's a very common one and it's done very early on uh, when a patient meets a doctor um, to really see if the patient has any diseases at all or, or if there is a reason to, to, uh, to either prescribe uh, some, something or dive deeper in an area of that, that uh, seems to be a concern. So we count the red cells, indicating anemia, bleeding, pregnancy, metabolic disorders. We count the platelets, uh, which can indicate coagulation disorders, but also can be used um, as a tool to measure and control a chemotherapy regimen for cancer patients. And finally, the white blood cells. Uh, that gives a good indication of uh, infections of different kinds, but also allergies and potentially leukemia. And we'll get later into talking about the white cells, because this is a critical area. Uh, we have different versions of our systems. One, some, of, some of them, they count three subsets of white cells. Others, they count five subsets, and we talk about three part and five part. And in the future, one can expect even more parameters to become standardized. But that's the basis for three and five part, which you will hear later on. But the system is, um, is delivering these types of results very easily and very quickly in less than a minute. So here you can see an overview of our product portfolio. The Madonic and Swelab on the left hand side, those are our, our biggest products. And they are relatively similar, but we have a dual brand strategy, so we sell them in parallel in most markets. Uh, completely different uh, uh, market channels, distribution channels, so that in, we, can, we can get a bigger uh, combined market share for Bull. These are uh, three-part systems, uh, the, the three subsets of white cells. We also provide a five-part system called Quintus, and then we have the veterinary platforms. And together with these, we make and, and, and sell the reagents, the controls and calibrators, the cleaning products, and here's a reagent rotor for the chemistry system. So our offering is, is indeed uh, complete. And um, as a point of reference, these were launched, the latest versions, in 2015. These were both launched this year. And this is a little bit older. So this is an area of uh, a lot of work for us in, um, in the product development going forward. So our systems then are based on a modular approach. So they can be, they can be um, uh, adapted to the needs of, of the different patients or the different uh, customer groups, starting from a simple one in the left-hand corner and, and adding more features, such as a, a finger stick approach, where you can take, instead of a venous sample uh, from the arm, you can take a finger stick, just a drop of blood, and directly insert into the system in, in a unique manner. And then on this one, you can see also uh, a level of automation that allows for like a hospital, for example, to have automation as well. The bigger system in the centralized lab are highly automated, but we indeed offer uh, automation also for the smaller, for the smaller clinics. So um, looking at our resources and sites, we have product development in Sweden and in the US, in Florida, and we make instruments for the global market in Sweden. We used to have a plant in China as well, but that was shut down last year because of cost, cost reasons primarily. So now we consolidate everything in Sweden. Reagent production is done in Sweden and the US. So Sweden supplies Europe and rest of the world. The US plant supplies uh, Latin America and US and the control and calibrated production is in the US. And so we're investing selectively to grow our capacity. 
Uh, right now, our, we're running at a very high capacity in our manufacturing site for instruments in Sweden because of the India orders and other things. But the, here we can, we, can, we can adapt capacity by adding extra personnel and shifts. In the US, for on the control production, we are, have reached our capacity, so there is a project ongoing to increase that capacity. And it's a, that's a segment that we don't have that many competitors, so that's attractive for us to grow there further. And we're also looking at ways to potentially be even more regional in our reagent manufacturing, because the reagents are pretty bulky fluids, and shipping them across the globe uh, is, is maybe not optimal. So we have started a regional approach with US and Sweden, but we want to do more of that going forward. So a, you know, a quick summary of, of the second quarter. Uh, the, the Q1 in 2018 was a bit slow on sales, but the sales did pick up uh, to around a 3% growth in the second, second quarter. That was uh, in spite of the fact that we didn't have any major tenders. Major tenders can, can really be impactful for us, uh, because some, they, there are sometimes hundreds of instruments, and if they don't materialize in a quarter, uh, growth is a little bit slower. But on the other hand, um, uh, the, the margins were quite strong. Good improvement versus the same quarter last year. Uh, and we saw also the OEM and CDS brand business, where we supply reagents to other companies in the field, to instruments of other, manu other manufacturers. Uh, that was a bit weak, but we do expect that to rebound. We know relatively well what that development is going to look like. Um, and so um, and we were also able to finalize that acquisition that I mentioned earlier, uh, helping us to move the next generation product platform forward in a quicker way, launching the two systems in the vet market and securing an instrument tender in India for 650 instruments. Looking at some of the numbers, we can see that Africa Middle East was growing on a rolling 12, and in the quarter, very healthy growth based on large installations of instruments during last year that now starts to generate good reagent growth. Latin America picked up the pace after a little bit of a weakness during last year. Uh, and uh, Western Europe you know, continued at a decent pace, even though this is a fairly flat market for us in general. Eastern Europe was a bit weak. That's uh, challenging. We're going to work on that. And in the US, we saw a minus 11, but that's a bit, that, that number is a bit deceiving because uh, I mentioned early on, we saw a dip in the OEM and CDS business, and that's, we expect to rebound. But if you look at our, our own instruments, they actually grew by 48%, and consumables to our, to our own instruments grew by 13%. So US market uh, was doing really well for us. And Asia continues to grow even though in this particular quarter no major tender was, was delivered on. Looking at the sales, we can see that uh, we have, during seven, six, end of 16 and into 17, we established a, a quarterly revenue of above 100, uh, 100 million, and, and a little bit up and down, but uh, above that level uh, con constantly. A little bit of a dip in Q1, uh, but the recovery in Q2. And profitability has improved steadily uh, because of efficiency improvements, product mix, uh, as well as uh, there's a component as well of activation of R&D expense since we're driving uh, a new development, an ambitious development program. But even if you uh, re remove that effect, the, um, the profitability improvement is indeed there. So uh, one of the, the strengths that we have is, of course, the installed base. We sell through distributors, so in some countries we don't know exactly wh where each instrument is located. In some market we know exactly where they are, but looking at the accumulated sales over the past uh, 8 to 10 years, which is the lifetime of an instrument we expect, you can see that there's probably around 30,000 instruments out there that are consuming reagents for us and uh, creating that, that stable revenue stream. Um, and looking um, at another issue that recently um, come up, this is something we want to share with you, of course, as well. If you have followed this, the stock, you have seen a pretty dramatic effect on Monday, and that's because we received a warning letter from, from the US FDA. 
this is a challenging thing that we need to work on and uh, it, it's a high priority for for the management team to drive this going forward but a little bit of um, uh, details around it might be useful so uh, the us fda came to our manufacturing site in sweden to audit us uh, in may this year this is a routine audit they come in a cycle of two to four years so they've been uh, visiting us before uh, and they came again um, uh, in may and we received some observations from them it's not uh, unusual of course that you get some kind of feedback on uh, on an inspection like that and we got a we got a few observations from them after that meeting so we responded to that within the stipulated 15 days uh, and the, it, the response includes some provision of data and our plans to improve over time uh, and so we have We've been sticking to that improvement plan, delivering every month updates to the FDA about the status of that improvement. Um, and then uh, we, have, we have come quite far in the implementation of that. And, but unfortunately, Friday afternoon, we did receive a warning letter from the US FDA. And we did release the press release later that day. So they state that the implemented procedure improvements that we have uh, started doing uh, are not quite ad adequate and they want us to to take a second look at those uh, and even more so they are emphasizing uh, evidence of us actually implementing these improvements they want to see documentation of our training of the staff uh, they want to see a retrospective review and so on so a lot about is, is about really verifying that we have indeed implemented these improvements that we have promised and of course we have but we will also take a step back and look at is there something more we should be doing because it's important to note that the fda doesn't tell you do this and do that and you'll be okay they will tell us we are not happy you need to improve and then it's up to us to figure out how to, do, to make those improvements and what we need to improve. So it's always a good thing to take a step back, engage some consultants and really assess, are we missing something here? So that is what we will be, do, we'll be doing. So we take this really seriously and uh, it's the high priori highest priority for the team now going forward. Uh, but it's, it's important to note that, of course, we are in an environment where regulatory compliance is critical. And uh, we are, we have been investing over the eight, past 18 months quite a bit in this. We hired a new person, an American lady, uh, to be promoted into the executive team responsible for quality and regulatory affairs. We've strengthened the regulatory team as well as manufacturing process team and the service team. And we have engaged external consultants to do like a mock type of uh, assessment of us, giving us feedback that we can improve on. Uh, and we will continue to dedicate a lot of resource to this going forward and seek a uh, second opinion externally as well. Uh, it's important to note though that this is a warning letter. It's a warning, uh, no more, no less. Uh, it does not uh, limit us from producing or selling these products. So that's important to know. Uh, finally, on, a, on, a, on that same note, so US market is important to us, around 30% uh, of, of our sales go there. But uh, of that, around 35% is, is uh, instruments if you look at a global average. So that means it should be around 10% for instruments, but actually since the US market is a replacement market, no major tenders and such, uh, instrument sales in the US is, is below that 10% average. So that's about the FDA issue. So uh, on a more positive note, the tender in India is a very exciting thing for us. We secured that in competition with many uh, major global companies. Um, and uh, we are happy to, to say that India is our largest market in Asia. We are number two in that market after the Japanese Sysmex. It's growing at a nice pace, 18 to 20 percent. And uh, the government is investing heavily in, in providing healthcare to, 
to the people in, in, the, in the rural areas and smaller towns and cities, and also extending healthcare insurance coverage to the less privileged. So this opens up a whole new market that fits us really well. So we were able, we were able to secure a tender in one of the states of India of 650 instruments, the biggest uh, tender ever we won. And it's in relation to uh, around the 4,000 instrument manufacturing on a normal year. So it's a big one. So our manufacturing team is working very, very hard right now to deliver on these instruments. Uh, so uh, really, really high pace in the manufacturing site. And so um, we hope that this tender will also lead to other tenders in the, in the region, as well as potential additional sales to that specific state. So we talked about the veterinary market, interesting growth market for us, uh, and it's been relatively small. But with these two new product launches in the hematology as well as chemistry, we think we have a lot to gain going forward here. And we're also investing in resources to drive these uh, products in a stronger way. And with the portfolio, we can also access a stronger distribution network. So this is exciting for the future. We have an agreement with a local company here from Lund, Cellavision, which is a company active in the hematology field, but have traditionally been focusing on the centralized segment in which we have not been in. So, uh, but now they're developing a new product and we have, we have signed an agreement with them. Our customers today are, they only have the option of manual microscopy because this example of a bigger television instrument is pretty pricey and too, too big for, for a small lab that we sell to. Uh, so now, uh, oftentimes when you do a cell count with using our system here, you need to do a further analysis in 10 to 15% of the cases, and then you really have to do, the, do it manually. And this becomes a, a bottleneck for many of our customers. But with the, the new system from Cellavision, uh, we, we can provide a system that meets the needs and, and fits really well with our portfolio. This is a, a rendering of the system, but it's, it's, uh, it's close to launch. Um, and it's an interesting thing here is that it's, it's quite small, uh, very similar to our instrument size. And it's all, all in one, everything is in, in embedded in the same case. And it, most importantly, perhaps, is it's got this price per test option. So our customers cannot afford a very expensive one-time investment. But this one with the price per test option, it can be a much lower price or even for free. And we can charge uh, per test, which is what we do with our other systems. So it fits the business model really well. We talked about next generation product development. So this is a, a picture of, of the work we are doing in developing the next generation. Uh, we have a long history of developing hematology systems internally. We've got the expertise in all areas, uh, pumps and valves, sample aspiration, fluid management, the impedance technology sensors, graphical user interface, drivers and boards and whatnot. What's new to us and what's required in this five-part analysis, the more advanced uh, and more detailed white cell analysis is the laser and optical sensors. So we've acquired a technology in this field. And what is going to happen is that we are going to use some of the parts of that new technology that we acquired combined with our own development. So the new laser module we'll be using will be a state of the art using some components from this and some of our own developed components. And this, this whole thing will reduce uh, time to market and reduce the risk as well. Talking about the market, we talked about decentralized and centralized. The centralized market is, is much bigger, and here's where many of our global competitors really focus, because it's a big market. We, however, we focus on this one, the decentralized, and we provide both three-part and, and uh, five-part, even though we're stronger in this one. It's the bigger chunk of the market, but it's uh, the, the five part is growing faster, so therefore we're upgrading our portfolio for five part. If you look at the size, of course, this is attractive, but looking at the growth, the decentralized hematology market is very exciting. And so we're happy about having that, that focus. And there are many drivers behind that growth. It's, it's, uh, the potential is huge. There are many, many labs, more than 100,000 labs out there, probably substantially more than that. Uh, we, we, of course, can benefit from the, the macro trends, such aging population, increased access to healthcare, 
uh, and so on. Uh, and also we see a trend towards near patient diagnostics, uh, both in the, in, the rural, in the rural areas and in the developing markets, but also in more developed markets where uh, patient convenience uh, and so on is, is, is driving this trend as well as cost efficiency. It's much cheaper oftentimes to do the test locally, avoid a uh, follow-up visit with a doctor, avoid logistics cost and so on. So our strategy is then, we are focused of course on protecting and growing our core business. We've got a healthy and growing core business. So we're gonna improve that in terms of efficiency, capacity expansion, quality and regulatory efforts, and launching the next generation product platform. We have been quite ex successful in growing in emerging markets, and we will continue doing that by uh, investing in the right resource locally to drive that uh, success further. We want to grow in new customer segments and markets, even though we are present in all regions of the world, there are still many countries where we're not active. And we can also s go into new customer segments. For example, in some countries we've been quite successful in the blood center segment, but we have not rolled that strategy out globally yet. So there are more segments for us to go in. I mentioned the OEM and CDS brand. Uh, these are where we sell our reagents uh, to other suppliers and uh, to other suppliers' instruments. There are many parts of this business that are attractive, which we will invest in, and it's a quite stable and profitable business. And finally, broadening the product portfolio. We are developing new platforms uh, internally, as we talked about. We are, we are signing agreements, uh, with the, like the one with Cellavision. And we hope to add further products through agreements like that, but also acquisitions. So, and we're investing heavily now for growth, I would say, the next generation uh, development platform, driving the regional growth and efficient commercialization of what is a, becoming a much, much broader product portfolio. So two additions this year already, and the uh, Cellavision coming in the, in the coming months, and there's more that we're looking into. So we got to commercialize that in a good way. Uh, talking about the differentiation that we have from competitors. So, so both our products and our organization is really focused on this decentralized near patient market. And that sets us apart from many of our competitors. And it gives us the right, the right focus and also the speed to implement what our specific segment really needs. We stand out as it as it, stand, as it um, relates to quality and reliability, ease of use and low life cycle cost. This is something where uh, we really um, uh, oftentimes win the tenders based on this. We have a reputation for strong service and support. We have some unique features, the finger stick technology, some, uh, some internal designs uh, that are unique and giving us that reliability that many of our competitors lack. Uh, we have also the um, autoloader system for higher volumes, etc. Uh, so a list of things that set us apart. And we have the two brand strategy, which is also fairly unique, but is giving us a bigger combined market share than we otherwise would have in many of the markets. So what are the challenges and opportunities? So we, we are in a fragmented and competitive market. We have a lot of competitors, big ones, oftentimes from China or or France, or, uh, or Japan, uh, and then we have a bunch of smaller ones from Eastern Europe and China, um, and we are roughly a global number four in, in, the, in market share. Uh, we see that in some markets, like in India, the price on instruments are quite low, so we have to uh, deal with that. Uh, we have to continuously evolve our product portfolio, of course, to deliver product development that's relevant to our customers. And we can sometimes see volatility quarter to quarter, depending on if we win a tender or not, and it, it impacts profitability and revenue, of course. Currency is something that we can be vulnerable to, but right now it's, uh, it's a tailwind. We're, we're benefiting from, from the weak krona and the strong dollar. And the regulatory compliance is, is, it can be a challenge, but I would also say it's a opportunity because even though we struggle with it at times, it's still something we can do and we've proven that we can manage. Um, many of our smaller competitors are not able to, to manage the requirements of, for example, uh, selling in the US or CE marks or, and so on. So this, this is also a barrier to entry that helps us. Veterinary market growth potential for us. 
We're continuously working on efficiency and structure in manufacturing. We're broadening the portfolio, strengthening our, our regional presence. Uh, and uh, we continue to grow in the emerging markets. And uh, we think we can continue to benefit from this near patient trend that we really see strongly in, in many markets. So, so these are the main challenges and opportunities as we see it. Financial targets then. So our EBIT margin, we have a goal of uh, being above 15%. Last year that goal was 13 and we raised it to 15. Right now we're above uh, that 15% level, but it can of course fluctuate by quarter. A growth rate for the five to six years in, in, in the past have been in the range of nine, eight, nine percent. Uh, right this year we're a bit slower start to the year, but 10 percent remains our goal, even though uh, it'll be hard, I think, to, to reach that goal for this year. Um, it's not a forecast, it's a goal. And on the, on the, on the balance sheet side, uh, we have the ability, according to our policy, to take on debt three times EBIT, but uh, we currently have a um, net cash position, so pretty strong balance sheet. Uh, and then a dividend policy, 25 to 50% of, of the profit, and the, la the most recent dividend was around 25. So that's it. Um, I open up for questions. <laughs>